Uh, all right. So um, you wrote a, gr- a great article. Uh, it's in Real Clear Investigations. Now, what is what is Real Clear Investigations? It's a site. They do, uh, you know, they're part of this thing called Real Clear Politics, which. Oh, I know Real Clear this, Politics. Yeah. Yeah. And then, so that's the that's the investigative side of oh, it. And okay. they've been doing a lot. A lot of stuff on Russiagate, and they invited me to uh, to write something for them. So th- this is what I did. Uh, and the headline is uh, "Crowd Strike Out." <laughs> That's funny. Crowd Strike Out. M- Mueller's own report undercuts its core Russia meddling claims. So I'll just go through this article real quick because you're showing how Mueller's own report uh, undermines his core statements, right? So at a May press conference capping his tenure as special counsel, Robert Mueller emphasized what he called the central allegation of the two-year Russia probe, the Russia, which is the Russian government, Mueller sternly declared, engaged in multiple systematic efforts to interfere in our election, and that allegation deserves the attention of every American. So multiple systemic efforts to interfere in our election. The report claims that the interference operation occurred principally on two fronts. One, the Russian military intelligence officers hacked and leaked embarrassing Democratic Party documents and a government linked troll farm. Number two. So there's two things. There was the military that hacked into the DNC and got their emails and released them through WikiLeaks. And the second part is these troll farms orchestrated a sophisticated and far reaching social media campaign that denigrated Hillary Clinton and promoted Trump. Um, And, but the problem is he doesn't prove any of that. And here is how, here is how it describes the core crimes under the investigation, the alleged GRU theft of DNC emails. So it said the GRU were the ones that stole the DNC emails. And it says between approximately May 25th, 2016 and June 1st, 2016, GRU officers accessed the DNC mail server from a GRU controlled computer leased inside the United States. During these connections, unit 26165 officers appear to have stolen thousands of emails. And now why do I have that highlighted in red? Because his conclusion is they appear. You know what that means? That means he doesn't have evidence because if he had evidence that they did, he would say it because he said it. Well, by by the way, there it is in the report appear, but he said it earlier here it is between on or about May to the DNC Microsoft Exchange server and sold th- and stole thousands of emails. There's no wishy washy language there. They said they did it. They stole it. They didn't say they appear to have stolen it. So that's that's crucial, right, Aaron? Yeah, there's a change of language there. It goes from certainty and in indictment to you know uh, about over a year later when they submit their report. Uh, because the the indictment was handed down in July 2018, uh, this report is submitted in March 2018, in March 2019. So almost a year later, the final report comes, and all of a sudden Mueller is using qualified language, and that suggests to me that Mueller does not have ironclad proof that the Russians stole the emails. He, what I what I've been told in terms of the alternative theories about what they did here, uh, in terms of building a case is you know there may have been russian uh hacking of dnc servers but they may have basically conflated those instances with this instance here used information they got from that mixed that all up added a whole bunch of other stuff which i talk about in the piece including this you know, apparent use of guccifer 2.0 a cutout to make it look as if uh the theft of the dnc emails uh was a russian hacking operation when, you know, as their as their language suggests and their own evidence uh, suggests, they, they aren't convinced of that anymore. So he went from the indictment saying this definitely happened to the report that he wrote himself saying, ah, it appears. So that's a sh- that's a very big shift in language, which indicates they don't have evidence. Uh, so let's go back to this, Gilbert. So the report also concedes 
that Mueller's team did not determine another critical component of the crime it alleges. How the stolen Democratic material was transferred to WikiLeaks. So that's crucial. So if you know somehow that they, you're able to knock down that they, the Russia got these emails and you say WikiLeaks got them from them. Well, can you, how do you know that? They don't. They don't. In fact, he doesn't know that. And he, he doesn't ever tell you that, how that happens. The report, uh, right? Correct. That's right. Uh, he has never said this before. Previously, in that July 2018 indictment of the GRU, Mueller suggested but didn't outright say it. And he couldn't outright say it because it's probably not true. Yes. That uh, WikiLeaks got these emails from a Russian, alleged Russian cutout called Guccifer 2.0. So Mueller strongly suggested, he wanted everybody to believe that WikiLeaks got the emails from Guccifer 2.0. Uh, he didn't outright say it, though. And now, finally, when it comes to his report, he explicitly says we cannot rule out the possibility that the emails were physically transferred in the summer of 2016, which means that somebody brought them to WikiLeaks uh, through a storage device in person. We're not transferred over the Internet. So if all of a sudden you go from suggesting that uh, that WikiLeaks got the emails from a who you allege to be a Russian cutout, who probably isn't, by the way. Uh, to now saying you don't know how the emails were sent. That says you do, you have no idea. Mueller has no idea how the emails were transferred, which is interesting in contrast to what he claims to know otherwise. He claims to know all these detailed all this detailed information about how Russia allegedly hacked into the DNC. So that's a pretty glaring uh, discrepancy and a huge shift in language going from suggesting something to acknowledging that you actually have no idea. Also, the t his you say the report's timeline defies logic. According to its account, WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange announced the publication of the emails not only before he received the documents, but before he even communicated with the source that provided them. I'll, I'll, I'll explain what this means. So on, on June 12th, 2016, there is, it is in The Guardian, WikiLeaks to publish more Hillary Clinton emails, Julian Assange. But they say that they didn't even fucking talk to Guccifer or the other, uh, what this is called, uh, DC, DC Leaks. Leaks yeah. They didn't even talk to them till two days later. So why would that, why would Julian Assange make an announcement that he has something he's never even seen yet? That doesn't make any sense. So why would so if Julian is so that's why the timeline doesn't make sense. Uh, and then, OK, so right. So that's correct. I got that part right. Exactly right. Uh, according to Mueller's the, the account that that Mueller wants you to take away from his narrative, Assange would have had to have spoken, uh, would have had to have announced the, the that he had these DNC emails before he received them from uh, his alleged Russian source and before he even communicated with them. And by the way, he doesn't even, according to Mueller's account, if Assange got the emails from Guccifer 2.0, that happens in like mid-July. So that's well over a month after Assange first announces he has the DNC emails. Yeah. So th so Mueller's timeline is off. He it defies logic. He's saying that, well, this is where he got the WikiLeaks, got the emails from. Uh, Guccifer and this DC leaks. And then he, and then Mueller himself establishes that they didn't have communication until after Julian Assange had already announced he had the emails. So that's exactly. why that timeline is complete bullshit. And Mueller undermines his own assertions. Now here's one more. This, this is to me hilarious. Uh, and yet one more significant inconsistency Mueller asserts that the two Russian outfits running the Kremlin-backed operation, Guccifer 2.0 and DC Leaks, they communicated about their covert activities over Twitter. That's according to Mueller. Oh, really? These highly sophisticated... Well, here it is. Here's what he says. The Twitter account Guccifer sent DC Leaks a direct message, which is the first known contact between the personas. Really? So this highly sophisticated uh, Russian operative, sophisticated spy op thing app, they're, they're, 
they're really communicating through DMs on Twitter, which they know the NSA is fucking monitoring. Are you shitting me? That's what we're supposed to believe, Aaron? That's what we're supposed to believe. <laughs> this now, is by the, the kind way, of- you know, and, you know, somebody pointed this out to me. Mueller doesn't tell us what language they were speaking in. Were they speaking in Russian or were they speaking in English? Ah, uh, when they DM'd each other. Yeah, yeah. It, it's it's too bad that Mueller leaves that out because I think that could give. I us bet some, it was English. I bet it was English too, but we don't know that for sure. But because Guccifer two point oh is probably invented by the intelligence community. Well, that's the theory, right? So we don't know. The point is, Guccifer 2.0, who uh, R- Mueller says is a Russian intelligence cutout, who he strongly suggests gave the emails to WikiLeaks. Guccifer 2.0 does not appear on the scene until after Assange announces that's that he right. already has the already has the emails. And Guccifer 2.0 also makes all these claims. He 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 takes credit for the hack. Uh, he releases some files that come from the DNC, uh, but. Are uh, are you know are not of a very high quality, and they contain very like metadata that makes it very easy to discover that it's a Russian speaker. So whoever it is is very sloppy. So all of a sudden we're supposed to believe that the GRU has gone from doing this sophisticated hacking operation to now being totally sloppy and even having Russian uh, metadata. There's a username on one of the files that's the name of the founder of yes. the Soviet secret police. So th- so there's all these clues, and you know I mean. I'm not saying anything definitive, you know, because uh, like my my point simply is this. Mueller has not proved his case. And in fact, his own evidence that he adduces undermines his case, coupled with a lot of other investigative shortcomings in his uh, whole probe. I mean, for one thing, he never spoke to Julian Assange. Here you have the key figure at the heart of this whole thing. And Mueller quotes Assange's statements to the media in his report. Yes. He shows no, no, no interest. He showed no interest in ever speaking to him. And one of the reasons I think that is, is because Assange has said publicly that the Russian government was not his source and that he could prove that. He, in fact, offered the U.S. government the opportunity to prove that uh, because he was in talks uh, because he was going to release um, some documents from the CIA, this Vault 7 release. And the CIA wanted to mitigate the, the impact of, of that leak by at least doing some redactions, which Assange was open to. And in the process, he also offered to provide the government with evidence that could rule out certain parties in the uh, theft of, of Democratic Party emails, Wid- which is widely inferred to be m- meaning he could rule out the, the role of Russia in that uh, because he had previously denied Russia's role. And those talks were proceeding. But who killed them? Jim Comey, the then director of the FBI. Jim Comey will also was a director of the FBI when the FBI uh, relied on forensics supplied by CrowdStrike, so we're gonna a, get uh, ENC contractor. So yeah. let's. So we're going to get to actually both those things that you just brought up. So you also go on to say the U.S. intelligence community. This is what Julian Assange said. The U.S. intelligence community is not aware of when WikiLeaks obtained its material or when the sequencing of our material was done or how we obtained our material directly. Julian Assange said that in t- January 2017. And let's remember never ever has ever had to retract anything he's ever printed or said. Uh, WikiLeaks sources in relation to the Potesta emails and the DNC leak are not members of any government. This is Julian Assange. He's saying that the WikiLeaks sources in relation to the Podesta emails and the DNC leak are not members of any government and they are not state parties and they do not come from the Russian government. And the Mueller report has zero evidence to debunk what he just said. In fact, the Mueller report debunks its own, undermines its own assertions. Um, Mueller does not explain, this is exactly what you were just talking about, Mueller does not explain why he included Assange's comments as reported by media outlets in his report. So if you read the report, he has quotes from Julian Assange, but... Why did he decide not to speak with Assange directly or ask to see his physical proof during a two year investigation? You would think you'd want to talk to that guy. You'd think you'd want to, inve- to have a meeting with Julian Assange, maybe investigate, maybe interview him, see what he knows. What he didn't. He didn't do any of that. That's unbelievably suspicious to me. Isn't and that- you can't say, and you can't say it, it was because he only had limited time and limited resources. He had unlimited. He had unlimited resources. He, they talked to everybody. They talked to 
Hope Hicks, George Papadopoulos, Rob Goldstone, right. all these, you know, weird characters. Randy Credico. Oh, Randy Credico. But they didn't talk to Assange. Yeah. 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 Uh, it gives you the double CK. They talked to, they, they talked to Jimmy. They talked to Jerome Corsi, <laughs> this far right conspiracy theorist who helped push, who helped push the birther narrative because Corsi said in public that he had some secret knowledge of WikiLeaks plans via Roger Stone. And they, they had all these sessions with Jerome Corsi. There's a long Washington Post article about this, trying to get Corsi to talk and trying to get Corsi to tell them what they know. Cause they were so desperate to, to milk something out of this whole giant dud. But yet they couldn't talk to Julian Assange. It just raises yet one more red flag. So this is one red flag after another red flag. And here's another one. And we've covered this on the, on the show before. Uh, the server, the DNC server, was never inspected uh, by the FBI. In fact, they relied on an outside group to in fact in investigate and inspect the server. It was called CrowdStrike. Now... Tell me why that's a bad idea, Aaron. Because CrowdStrike is a private company. And even if they have the utmost integrity, I don't think the government should be relying on private firms for, you know, sensitive forensics when it's trying to, uh, you know, conduct an intelligence in investigation that leads to serious allegations against a foreign government. All the more so if that private company, CrowdStrike, is working for a uh, political party with a huge partisan interest in the Russian narrative, you know, and, you know, it'd be one thing if that's, so tell people how that is. And that's a crowd is. And it'd be one thing if that was, you know, the democratic party's only uh, connection to the Russian investigation. But unfortunately they're not just connected to the uh, Russian hacking allegation via crowd strike. They're also at the heart of the collusion allegation, which is the core allegation, because it was none other than Democratic Party contractor Fusion GPS and Christopher Steele that produced that ridiculous uh, dossier. dossier alleging a high level Trump Russia conspiracy and blackmail scheme. So you have the Democratic Party behind that. You have the Democratic Party also behind the hacking allegations with via CrowdStrike because CrowdStrike was the first to lodge those allegations. And we can get to it, too. But there's also a huge Democratic Party role and this whole scare about Russian social media. And in fact, that comes, that originates with aides to Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama. And we, we've learned now in the case of CrowdStrike that uh, not only did the government rely on CrowdStrike's forensics when it comes to you know uh, uh, investigating the DNC servers, but they also used re redacted reports that CrowdStrike itself submitted. And when I say redacted, I don't mean redacted by the government. I mean that CrowdStrike wrote some reports redacted them itself and then submitted it to the government and so, the government had just and the government just took CrowdStrike's word that you know it was all kosher so so basically yeah let, let me just break it down for people dumb like me so CrowdStrike is a completely compromised organization working with the Democratic Party uh the FBI never inspects those this the DNC server CrowdStrike does it and then submits a report to the FBI that is redacted. What does That's that mean? Right. That means that CrowdStrike did their investigation of the DNC server instead of the FBI. And then they submitted information that they found out, but they held back some information from the fucking FBI. Wait a minute. You don't redact information from the government. The government redacts information from you. But guess what? The FBI said, that's okay. You can redact it. And they didn't care. And uh, that's what they used to write this report, right? Exactly right. And listen, Jimmy, it's possible that all this is kosher. It's possible. It is. It is it's possible. But, but the fact is, you, there are so many red flags here. You have a private company redacting its own reports and giving to the government. A private company uh, resisting efforts because the FBI said they tried to get the servers, they tried, but, Demo but, but, but the Democratic Party was adamant and CrowdStrike was adamant that, that they not hand it over. And the, there are FBI officials who voiced frustration about that. That's correct. Uh, but that, which has, and also, look, CrowdStrike itself, their founder is an openly uh, anti-Putin Russian national. They've done very well in, uh, you know, they just passed, I think, I think the billion dollar mark or something like that. But, but the founder uh, is openly, you know, very hostile to words of Vladimir Putin. They had to retract a very key claim in March 2017. They accused Russia of carrying out a hacking operation in Ukraine yeah. using some of the same malware that they said Russia used inside the DNC hacking operation. They had to retract that. 
uh, which was covered not very widely, but covered actually in Voice of America, a U.S. government publication uh, that who really pushed the story. So they had to retract that. So they have a and, and another executive, Sean Henry, worked for Robert Mueller at the FBI, which means now you mean executive a, a, at CrowdStrike worked for Robert Mueller. Exactly right. Yeah. Yeah. Which just means that Robert Mueller, you know, coming from the FBI, he inherits an investigation that that has been uh, given to him already by the FBI. He's not the most unbiased source to conduct an independent investigation that can really look at the facts. I think what he basically did was conduct it. He he knew he had no collusion early on. He knew this whole thing was baseless, but he needed to validate all this stuff. And that's why we got this prolonged two year investigation and Robert Mueller overlooking you know, potential biases at such a, a core source like CrowdStrike. So uh, I and I people gave me shit for reporting this originally. When, I know. Go ahead. I know that did Jimmy. And let me say, you know, I was relatively agnostic on all this stuff. I kind of I, I sort of focused on the collusion angle and the Russian inter and the and the social media stuff. You know, part of it was a, a lack of familiarity with, with computer jargon. You were on this from the beginning. I saw how much heat you got for it. But again, as more and more information comes out, those who were skeptical, like yourself and Bill Binney and Ray McGovern, who, who really pushed back forcefully, I think are, are looking increasingly vindicated. Yeah, those the people who um, attacked us for being right and doing actual journalism will never admit it. And they're never going to apologize because those are the kind of people those motherfuckers are. They're herd <laughs> mentality, unoriginal thinking motherfuckers. And uh that's uh, and and that, that so and they don't have much integrity and it just it's 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 a, a goddamn jag off nightclub comedian out integrities them is they should be embarrassed because I don't have any integrity and yet I'm doing better than them. Uh, so here you go on you say uh, if it was really an internet hack this gets back to the technical part of the Mueller thing if yeah. it was really an internet hack the NSA could easily tell us when the information was taken and the route it took after being removed from the DNC server. So Bill Binney explained this on this show that the NSA has a copy of everything that's happening on the internet. And so they, if, if it happened the way they said, if Russia hacked the DNC server, they would have a copy of it. And then they would have a copy of how it left too. And the fact that they don't tells Bill Binney and who is Bill Binney? He was the number one code breaker in the history of the NSA. That's who he was. And a whistleblower, which is why you don't never heard of him. And he said that the reason why that they're not showing you that evidence is because it doesn't exist. Because if it existed, they would show it to you. Um, but given Mueller's qualified language and his repeated use of the inner around rather than outlining specific down to the second timestamps, which the NSA could provide, Binney is skeptical that the NSA intelligence was included in the GRU indictment and the report. So what he's saying is that they didn't even use the NSA intelligence to write this report or the indictment. They were probably just going off those bullshit claims from the original intelligent community assessment. Am I right about this? That is the theory of Benny. I mean, who also he also points out that uh, for NSA information to be released, I mean, uh, by default, it's classified. So at a certain point, it would it would have had to have gone through a declassification to be included in these indictments and in this report. And there's no record of any sort of de declassification. I asked the NSA, I asked the National Security Division, I asked Robert Mueller's uh, uh, spokesperson. Nobody would confirm to me that any information was declassified. So <laughs> we, don't, we, we don't know yet. I mean, look, it's possible some NSA information is in there. But according to former NSA technical director Bill Binney, uh, he's very confident that there wasn't. It's also it's also possible that Congress is working in the interest of their voters. It's possible. <laughs> OK, so we'll get to this part, the social media campaign. So, again, remember how they so there's the two parts of how Russia attacked us through their hacking into the DNC and Podesta emails and also by making social media memes that got everybody crazy to vote for uh, Donald Trump instead of Hillary Clinton. Um, 
Mueller's other central allegation regards a Russian active measures social media campaign with the aim of, quote, sowing discord and helping to elect Trump. In fact, Mueller does not directly get this. He does not directly attribute that campaign to the Russian government and makes only the barest attempt to imply a Kremlin connection. According to Mueller, the social media form, the social media form of Russian election influence came principally from the Internet Research Agency, a Russian organization. So in the so Mueller doesn't even connect in so what you're saying, Aaron, is that in the Mueller's report, he doesn't even connect the the social troll that troll farm on Twitter and Facebook, he doesn't even connect that to the government, Russian government. Exactly right, Jimmy. This is an example of the kind of disingenuous, misleading language that Mueller and his team adopted. They make a sweeping conclusion. They say the Russian government engaged in systematic interference, and they talk about this social media operation being a part of that because that was principally, they say, this was the second element. But then when you actually look at their detailed uh, uh, allegations and all their claims about this Russian social media effort, they never once say that it was uh, it was carried out with the cooperation or knowledge of the Russian government. There's one line where Mueller says that Putin has ties to the owner of the of this troll farm and he cites one article in The New York Times. OK, that's the extent of Mueller's <laughs> attempt to even suggest, not even assert, suggest a connection to the Russian government, as he even said, in his, if you read his his news, if you read his news conference comments closely, the the one he delivered at the end of May, he says that this was carried out by a private Russian entity, which it's basically a clickbait troll farm that put out juvenile social media ads that nobody saw, that were barely even about the election. They were mostly, you know, there was Buff Bernie memes and Jesus memes, and uh, you know, cer certain memes targeted at. African Americans and gun owners and evangelicals, um, and most of these ads ran after the election. So this whole thing is so stupid to begin with. The, the, this notion this could have had beyond zero percent impact on the election. But on top of that, Mueller doesn't even try to connect it to, to the Russian government. So He's we, basically, so yeah. we, we we reported this on this show in real time that the Internet Research Agency, this is the troll farm that they're saying did all this mayhem in, in, in from Russia. It has already been reported on in, front, in the New York Times it, that it's just a troll farm. And what, a, what, a, tro what do troll farms do? They try to get social media followers so they can then spam them with advertising later. That's exactly what they were doing. In fact, you, you, even in Mueller's report, well, here's what it says. Uh, Mueller says that the IRA, that, that's the Internet Research Agency, that troll farm. So Mueller says that that troll farm spent... A hundred thousand dollars between 2015 and 2017. Of that, just forty six thousand dollars was spent on Russian linked Facebook ads before the 2016 election. So for so this is all about forty six thousand dollars in Facebook means. And the majority of them had nothing to do with the election, had nothing to do with politics. They were stuff like, hey, are you having a problem with masturbation? Take my hand and we'll beat it together. That, that was the Jesus one. So those were the kind of, they were just trying to get followers so they could then spam that. And that's what fucking troll farms do. And and so even Mueller's own, they admit it in the goddamn, that's it, 46 grand. was that, and, yeah. and compare that to what? Compare that to, that, that amounts to about 0.05% of the $81 million spent on Facebook ads by the Clinton and Trump campaigns combined. Go ahead, Adam, Aaron. Well, again, it, it just shows what a complete uh, joke all this was. And yes, as you say, Mueller even acknowledges in his original indictment of this troll farm that they sold ads for something like twenty five dollars. Like they they sold ad space to vendors to their uh, for their accounts that had big followings for something like twenty five dollars a pop. Right. So they were trying to make money off of it. They were a it's a it's basically clickbait capitalism. And yeah, maybe some of the some of these Russian troll farm workers in their broken English and juvenile memes pr had a preference for Donald Trump. I mean, sure. I mean, but the point is the notion that any of this could have impacted a single voter is really an insult. And, and the whole thing, it just shows the contempt 
that the Democratic Party elites and media elites who push this narrative that they have for average voters. The idea that their voters are so malleable that they could be brainwashed by juvenile Russian clickbait that nobody even saw. There was recently an article in the Washington Post that last week that, saw, that pointed out that fewer than 1,000 people in the key swing states, Wisconsin and Michigan, I think Pennsylvania too, even saw these ads. So the fact that they were talked about, let alone the fact that they were, you know, and then, and then you the fact that they're compared to Pearl Harbor and a cyber 9-11, all this crazy stuff, it shows that this has nothing to do with any real concern about disinformation. This was an act of disinformation to sow fear and for Democratic, for failed Democratic Party neoliberals like Hillary Clinton and their campaign to blame Russia for their own failures. Uh, in fact, this is, this strategy, the Senate report from Oxford University's Computational Propaganda Project observes, this strategy, meaning what that troll farm was doing, their strategy, the troll farm strategy, is not an invention for politics and foreign intrigue. It is consistent with the techniques used in digital marketing. So what we reported at the get-go was that this is just a troll farm doing exactly what troll farms do, try to bait people into joining their page or their Twitter followers so they can spam them. And that's exactly what the goddamn Senate report from the Oxford University's Computational Propaganda Project found, to, found out also. But Aaron... So you're going to get obviously get invited on Chris Hayes show or Rachel Maddow show to explain this to them, right? Mm. Uh, probably not yet. No, <laughs> no. <laughs> you know, and, and Jim, you know what? For anybody who, who, who talks about this stuff as being sophisticated, I would love for them to point to which ad by Russia or this Russian troll firm they think was sophisticated, which ad they think was effective and could have swayed the mind of a single voter. They can't. Because all these ads were in broken English, they were dumb, and they weren't even about the election. But look how much column space this took up, people comparing this to Pearl Harbor. I mean, you know, there hasn't been enough time yet to process how moronic and insane our political media culture has been and how just how rare voices of sobriety like you and I uh, have been throughout this thing, you know? And, and the, but the, the fact is now the Mueller report is done Mueller didn't even want to come testify to Congress. They had to drag him kicking and screaming to go by subpoena soon. So I, I think there will be more space now, hopefully, for us to do this because there has to be a reckoning. The people who gave us this for two years wasted so much valuable time, wasted so much valuable political energy on a conspiracy theory instead of actually channel, uh, challenging Trump's policies. In the process, you know, letting failed neoliberals like the Clintons uh, who lost to Trump off the hook and also ratcheting up tensions with Russia. So this thing has been a disaster. And that's why it's important to, 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 for us to continue to call this out now. Um, there's more to your article, but I think we covered the great, you know, the whole part about John Brennan. <laughs> uh, the fact that it, this was basically his, his, his brainchild and that he gets to ver validate his own work is kind of hilarious. But we, 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 we don't really have time to go into that, but. This was a this is a great article. We'll link to it when we drop this video. I'll put a link. It's uh, it's over at Real Clear Investigates. Okay. Hey, we just added St. Louis and Honolulu to our live tour schedule. Go to JimmyDoorComedy.com for a link for all the tickets for all our live shows. We might be coming to your town. Go check right now at JimmyDoorComedy.com. And if you like the show and want to support it, become a premium member. You can become a patron or through PayPal or go right to JimmyDoorComedy.com and become a premium member. That's the best way. We'll see you at a live show.